You muted the car. Give me a second, sir. So we're just checking if it's uh, still live. Yeah. Uh, we are live on YouTube. Or... Yeah, Good afternoon. We are live on uh, YouTube. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this panel discussion organized by the Trade Promotion Council of India. For this session, we have an August gathering comprising of Dr. Rajendra Prasad Sharma, Professor of Marketing Area, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade and Member, Committee for Advanced Trade Research, TPCI, Professor Hush Vardhan Verma, Faculty of Management Studies, Delhi Good University, Mr. Devarshi Sajay, Marketing Director. Uh, uh, Nikhar, your voice is echoing because much later than it is following. Yeah. Are, you, are you on two devices, Nikhar? You will have to. I'm on one Because every word that you spoke after a couple of seconds so that was repeating. Speak again, Nikhar, say something. I think, uh, yeah, now it's good. And uh, I would also request you all to be on mute. So that the voice doesn't echo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this panel discussion organized by the Trade Promotion Council of India. For this session, we have an August gathering comprising of Dr. Radri, uh, Rajendra Prasad Sharma, Professor, Marketing Area, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and member, Committee for Ad Advanced Trade Research, TPCI. Professor Harsh Vardhan Verma, Faculty of Management Studies, Delhi University. Mr. Debarshi De, Marketing Director, MyLab Discovery Solutions. And Ms. Priyanka Shah, Co-Founder, Expora. Exports are incredibly important to modern economies. Not only do they propel an economy's growth and help a country to earn foreign exchange, they also offer people and firms many more markets for their goods and opportunities to enhance their profit margins. For a country that aspires to be a $5 trillion economy in the next few years, some economists believe that India will need to ensure at least $1 trillion uh, worth of exports. Acknowledging the same, Prime Minister Narendra Modi commented last year, considering the size of our economy, our potential, the base of our manufacturing and service industry, India's exports have the potential to grow a lot. Marketing is an essential component of trading. A business has to market its products to create awareness about its brand and offerings. To cultivate a global audience, a brand may use local language to market its products after conducting some market research to understand the appetite in the potential customers uh, for their products. Understanding the essential elements of international marketing is imperative to a brand which is aspiring to be global. Taking a cue from this, TPCI is commencing an international marketing series for the benefit of exporters. This series intends to address some of the most common challenges faced by the industry in global expansion and share best practices for building a successful international brand. The first webinar in the series will be on the topic Market Entry Strategies for Exporters. It is crucial for India to diversify its export basket and identify new and lucrative markets as nearly 50% of India's exports are accounted for by just top 10 export destinations. During the session, panelists will deliberate on the most suitable approaches for new market selection and successful penetration. 
To get start this discussion, I would like to welcome Professor Harsh Vardhan Verma, Faculty of Management Studies. So, the USC, the UAE, China, Bangladesh, Singapore, the UK, Netherlands, and Germany are the top markets for Indian educators. What are some of the reasons for India's strength in these regions emerging as top markets? Well, thank you for the question. <clears throat> now. I don't know when you look at these uh, countries and and look at the uh, kind of exports which we do, whether to feel happy or uh, not so happy. Now, the, the superficially one can look at as to you know why we are able to export to these countries and why do they stack on top of the basket. Now, apparently, I think you know one of the reasons you can trace is that well there is there some kind of compatibilities which we enjoy now these compatibilities can be traced in terms of maybe political at the political ideology level you know so for instance you know these uh, countries share uh, democracies so politically i think you know we share commonality and sometimes if this this kind of commonality is not there it becomes an hindrance Similarly, for example, uh, culturally, are these company, uh, the, the countries are culturally aligned with the kind of values which we uh, espouse. Take for example, uh, the, the, the value of freedom, enterprise, individuality. So these are what you call multi-layered. If you try to see uh, the, the, the answer to this question, you know, so this is not so obvious variables you know which work to operate and create conducive environment but beyond that there is more fundamental is economic now point is are we really able to create strong value add for the people in these countries or are we able to create strong value add in terms of b2b market space wherein you create value add for the companies but nevertheless, in terms of uh, economic philosophy, I think we share, again, similarity in terms of spirit of entrepreneurship, spirit of innovation, spirit of competitiveness. So these are some of the reasons why these are favorite destinations. But one, if looks at uh, 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 the exports from a, uh, a deeper perspective, then I try to look at the composition of exports which we do <coughs> to these countries. Now, broadly, what we can classify here is that, well, you know, uh, some of these exports fall into the category of what you call as the low value add in the space of commodities. Some of these exports will get stacked up in another heap, which we can label as the light engineering. And some of us, some of these exports could be where there may be huge potential, but we are not doing well because of some reasons is that well though naturally we are endowed but there is a possibility like say for example leather apparel jewelry we do export uh, jewelry so to say but are we able to create a brand like Cartier, tiffany probably not we export leather but why is that we are not able to uh, become jimmy choose of the world similarly for example we may sell a truckload of uh, apparel or textile but one simple shirt in terms of price may outweigh the entire tonnage of your apparel which you have sold so the issue is that well you know we may be doing well and why are we doing well if i were to look take a serious look at it is that well you know uh, because of liberalization because of uh, cross border linkages what what has happened is that well you know the foreign companies have been able to operate out of India. So some of these companies which operate out of India, then there is some kind of technology transfer at a, at, at a smaller scale, which happens. Like take example, Benz as a company, right? Maybe it sources a lot of what you call parts. Similarly, take example, Sundaram fasteners, you know, Sundaram Clayton, they sell fasteners. But the issue is that, well, so, one of the reasons why we are able to do it and as a strategy where we should aim at is that well 
develop or foster cross-border linkages. Let these companies, like for example, Japanese, German companies operating in India in the engineering space. Result is that, well, we may have our own companies competing with them or we may get involved in the value chain, although at the lower level. But we may get involved. So once we get involved, we may be supplying to take for example Siemens, heavy engineering, right? So we once start uh, supplying to uh, the companies which is operating in India, then if we uh, achieve certain certain kind of excellence in what we are doing here, that becomes the basis to export. So what we are saying is that well, you know, these comp uh, the, the exports in these countries, there are some of you know, we, if you technically look at there are a couple of products where we have actually moving up the value chain, but rest of it is not all that great. But uh, we sell by and large these products, right, as, 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 as commodities. But what is left out is that, well, we don't have our own brand. So moving up the ladder becomes a challenge. Like take example, you know, making of a shoe, like Nike as a company makes shoes, apparently not. So the point is, you know, if you look at value chain involved in making of shoe, right? So they have transferred everything outside the, their country. But what they have retained is designing the shoe, right? Similarly, for example, major companies like cars, right? They may be outsourcing their so-called parts, right? But they may be investing in those technologies which become the point of differentiation, right? Which, which are actually, which signify heart of a product which ultimately gets marketed, right? So we are happy that well we are able to do it, but in certain sectors we have done well. I take example of pharmaceutical as uh, Mr. Day is getting into uh, uh, the area of health. India is a low cost destination for healthcare and there is a possibility that well, once we achieve excellence, so we, there is a possibility that we may end up uh, exporting lot of services in healthcare. Take for example, immunization thing, you know, this, which is what has happened. We have again emerged as a, uh, as a destination because we are scaling up. Our companies are bigger. We are, so we are uh, riding on uh, what we can call as the experience curve effect. So, so our cost of production comes down. So on the whole, what we are saying is uh, these, these companies favor us for maybe, maybe, you know, a uh, cost of uh, procurement, low cost of procurement, which is a happy situation, but at the same time, sad situation. I think incrementally, to begin with, I think it's, it's a good role. We are able to achieve some significant advantages. Like we are going to, if at all, boost our exports, we need to compete with China. China's example is typically that, well, Western companies okay, shifted their so-called uh, operations, which are typically low cost operations to China. And they thought this China, China is, will continue to be a tailor, but not become a designer. But once they achieve scale, now they are beating these Western countries in terms of designing. So they are moving up the scale. I think we need to have the same kind of model. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much sir, for your insights. Uh, this brings me to my next question for which I would like to come to uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. I have and also member uh, committee for advanced trade research. Sir, so what are some of the other markets that have an untapped export potential for India? And what criteria should a business deploy while selecting the right market for market entry? So thank you, Nikhar. This is uh, a set of two questions. Okay, first question first, because you are asking what can be the other markets? So since uh, more than 80% population of the world, 7.9 billion people on the planet, more than 80% live outside India, 82% to be uh, 80 to 83% to be precise. And, and you know, those 80 to 83% people don't live only in the uh, developed countries, USA, UAE, China, Bangladesh, okay? So as Professor Harsh Varma has set the tone, uh, that there are reasons why we have looked at these countries in terms of convenience, maybe the compatibility, the political ideology matching, or maybe Indian diaspora settling there, or maybe, you know, geographical proximity. If I talk of Bangladesh, because that's, I'm sitting in Kolkata and Bangladesh is just, you know, a couple of hours from here. 
so so those could have been the regions but but uh, there are more than 20 countries in the world uh, there are as many countries as the number of bones in my body so so you know with that kind of uh, the the uh, country and continent uh, configuration people the exporters let i will not use the word exporters the international business uh, you know community they get confused then with the, as to what country where do i go so you know uh, it's right that you have uh, set uh, started with market selection and entry mode selection and that addresses the question of where you know the first question that anybody who looks at exporting is where can i go and then the second question is once they determine that okay i can look at country x or x region then the question is how and how means the entry strategy so where and how is what we are discussing today and let me come down to the question specific one you asked where else other than the countries that professor harsh verma was talking about well uh, the other countries are in the apac region asia pacific southeast asia okay again uh, physical proximity as well as cultural distances very less you know and then the entire africa 54 countries lot of demand and supply gap if i talk about let's say uh, the varshis uh, company or the industry scenario healthcare the dg's share of africa is so high 25% dg share of the entire planet but but you know the when you look at the share of the uh, solutions or the medication or the facilities that they have resources then on resources you know only 11% is what africa has of the world but dg share is 25% so there is a huge demand and supply gap yeah so nikhar simultaneously i am also addressing the second question that what would be the criteria for somebody to look at when somebody identifies a market now when we look at dg share and these kinds of things then i am sure i can't go to very advanced countries right even in medical tourism services if china has become the manufacturing hub of the world then i think india holds a lot of potential in terms of becoming a hub for exporting and internationalizing its services we have already showcased and done that proven to the world in terms of it and it enabled services you know most of the developed countries all those countries which usa and U uae and uk and all these countries which you know in terms of the product basket you know we have been targeting they recognize us we we have high image as well as recognition in those markets for our it services yeah so healthcare as a service and you know i'm saying that demand supply gap is the primary criteria for identifying markets and that's a scientific criteria okay and and the other criteria could be and should be that our commerce ministry is busy signing lot of ftas negotiating discussing okay we participate in so many international meets and the the exporter exporting community should take benefit avail you know the benefits of these ftas because ftas are clear cut pointers about certain services and product categories which find potential and where we get a preferential treatment and we are we do stand more competitive if not price wise then you know even in on the quality front and those kinds of things i think that can also be an equally important consideration while we look at alternative markets uh, let's move beyond africa and and you know during the pandemic i have been seeing and we also authored a paper on this uh, latam entire latin america yeah brazil argentina chile colombia uruguay paraguay some of those countries are so interesting to do business and they have you know they stand much better in terms of ease of doing business okay you know except you know there are exceptions everywhere so if you know you will have some sierra leone or eritrea in africa you will also have a venezuela in uh, latam so latin america is also an interesting uh, you know market which our exporters should look at we despite having lot of geographical uh, high geographic distance we have cultural proximity with them a uh, lot of 
call centers and uh, telecom companies and you know uh, even the the IT services centers and agricultural uh, inputs, fertilizer companies, and these companies are doing in interesting uh, you know brisk business in those uh, markets. So LATAM and uh, Africa and APAC, you know, probably I'm talking of about 100 countries which uh, Indian exporters should look at, though this is going outside the uh, comfort zone because, you know, everybody when they look at marketing abroad, then probably, you know, what comes to their mind is maybe USA, Canada or, or New Zealand, Australia or some of the developed countries where Indian diaspora is there and, and it is, but, you know, it is also pretty tough to do business there because of the regulatory environment. Yeah, I know they are safe markets, government-wise, democracy-wise. So these could also be the criteria, right? So maybe there is high uh, level of corruption in certain countries, transparency, international shares, the ranking and all. Maybe it would be difficult to do business in countries in Africa, uh, except some like South Africa and maybe Mauritius. But, but I think it could be very, very uh, lucrative in terms of getting a higher unit value realization. So I think uh, uh, we should also look at the margin that we can get. That is a criteria to choose these countries. You get high margins if you if you look at a country like, you know, a remote country in uh, Africa or Latin. Yeah. And, and we should also see uh, market access, whether, you know, uh, we do have access, whether the standards we can comply. It, it is up to the capability of our exporters, our international business community. And if they determine, I'm sure they can, they can deliver on those standards. But yes, standards are there. We don't have market access everywhere, but, but there are databases and tools. And, and anytime, you know, they are welcome. We at IIFT uh, have this mission of uh, making the exporters and international business community excel in identifying right markets so that they don't make any mistakes there and, and then, you know, remain, become profitable there. So these are, you know, some of the thoughts to begin with, but, but as I reiterate, uh, we are discussing today on where and how. So maybe later, later uh, part, you know, we will discuss about the entry strategies. Nikar, uh, you want me to speak more or that's okay to begin with? For this question, I think uh, it suffices. And in fact, uh, this brings me to a very important question, which is uh, very inward looking for the firm, for which I would like to now move back to Professor Harsh Varma. Uh, so what factors should be kept in mind to gauge a firm's export readiness? And how can a company's, um, uh, you know, how can a company assess a market's import potential what practices should a company adopt um, to be a successful exporter? Nikar, thank you. I will answer your question purely from a marketing perspective, right? Uh, um, so whether a firm is ready to export or not, right? I think uh, on, on a blank slate, the company should write that well, is there any uh, distinction or excellence which the company has achieved? Now, if company is able to respond in a positive sense that, well, we have achieved excellence in something, whatever, it could be a full product, it could be a part of activity which you do in value chain, or it could be us simply responding to customer's call promptly, right? Um, small act of responding, you're managing to call, uh, managing the call in efficient and effective manner so that the other person gets delighted, right? So, so, so it's, it's, it's one thing to establish a call center. That's another thing to achieve uh, call center excellence. So you got to find out as to what kind of uh, 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 excellence you have achieved uh, in any sphere of business activity. Now, if you have not, now the question I will here say is that, well, a company before it takes plunge into export market, right? Needs to ask a question, are you ready to swim with sharks? Now, if you're ready to swim with sharks, okay, predators, right? Then, 
and if answer is positive you can take a plunge into uh, export market now so 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 if, uh, if 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 a company wants to know whether you are able to okay take a plunge or not if example you know uh, there are uh, uh, practices which companies follow right a simple practice like tip example how you advertise or promote your product now if you're excellent in that it makes uh, the answer nearer to the positive yes you can take a look similar tip example how durable or reliable uh, the product which you manufacture is now if it is right so these like tip example do you regularly gauge customers reactions and find out their points of frustrations and delight. So that means you are achieving excellence in a particular way. So as uh, Professor Rajendra Sharma said, right, is that, well, you know, a business, you should not look at it from the trading point of view. You know, when you say trade, trade is simply one of the activities wherein your ownership is transferred. That's it. But if you look, want to look at the exports, I mean, you, we need to have a bigger perspective where you holistically look at your your, your, your firms building export competitiveness in totality so issue is that well what are your practices now are you uh, so there are two ways to benchmark your practices practices is that well you know are you best domestically now if you are best domestically take example if you're making a, 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 a vaccine now is my vaccine as good as my next competitor so that means I have certain amount of competitiveness. Then I need to go to AstraZeneca. That will look, you know, how they are developing and marketing their vaccine. Now, if I am able to climb up to that, you know, then answer is positive. You can take a plunge. So, if if look if one looks at the uh, so-called, you know, good performing uh, uh, countries and companies of the world. Now, I was doing a seminar. Uh, I actually, uh, it was a small, slight consulting project for a company which was a Swiss company, right? So this Swiss company was making lube, right? So if you look at lube, lube is, lube is something which is, which is highly an exciting product, right? And many people don't even know what lube is. However, their cars or engines do run on lubes, right? But the issue is that, well, when I was talking to this company, they said that, well, we want to be not lube. We want to be engineering product. We want to be positioned as engineering product. You know? So it's one way of looking into lube as something like liquid, right? With some kind of properties by moving parts are not damaged, right? Another thing to look at it from the engineering point of view. So, so in that, during that course of discussion, I said that, well, how come? you look at lube from this pers uh, different perspective now this gentleman answered that well if you look at swiss he said that well we make one watch which may be equal to maybe 1000 or 200 watches which other countries make now the point is that well how come do they make uh, a watch you know which is equal to 2000 watches so india may be, end up producing 2000 watches and maybe 3000 4000 watches right but it will not come out command the same kind of price which this particular company from uh, Switzerland commands. He said that, well, our call to fame is precision. So he says, we invested in precision. So all countries of the world look at Switzerland as a destination for obtaining precision equipment, right? Now, to answer that question, one is that well what is it which india is known for right can we write can we claim that well india as a country is known for something in terms of having achieved excellence like like for example how how did uh, japan succeed in car markets of the world now they are not doing all that well but then they did in electronics right so their call to fame was once again they were able to manage to make cars which were extremely reliable compared to german cars oh sorry so, so the uh, us cars right so you need uh, the company needs to look at their practices practices right their products right their business model three things you need to take care of now 
if your practices are to be benchmarked with the best in the world and if answer is positive there is some kind of readiness if the products which you market okay are are comparable to the world's best products you are now finally is your business model sustainable now we may all like to participate in commodity business right but the question is that well are we ready to compete with china now if china has invested in building big plants where the cost of production is negligible in the sense that well what we make you know and what china makes is maybe 20 percent of the cost which we are able to do right now if we are not able to do that that means our business model is not something what so before taking a plunge indian companies you know may be interested in joining the bandwagon of exports but the point is that well you know what is your dna and how this dna dna is different and not only different how it contributes to the well-being of your customer in a different fashion that that needs to be answered so if 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 a company wants to know benchmark your practices with the best companies right benchmark your product find out that well how your product score over okay competition and finally your business model right so simply merely export so you'll not be able to gain traction in export market okay if your business model is not something which is so take example swiss companies have a business model very clear cut model right we will make few but very high order in terms of value chain china's model has been what we can indulge in dumping because we have big scale operations so our cost of production is lost now the question is where is india like to italy like to example italians now by virtue of maybe location maybe the kind of uh, endowment they have got they're excellent in designing so a chinese uh, sorry uh, uh, an italian suit costs maybe 100 times more than the ordinary suit which Jap which an american company is able to make or to example indian companies like similarly to example endowment benefit or geographic tagging you know to a similar to example uh, when you think of perfumes right now perfume by virtue of the fact that well it comes from france automatically there is some kind of benefit which is conferred onto it right so indian companies have a have have a difficulty here in terms of finding out your readiness so if, when you talk about readiness find out that well you know what is your dna and is it discriminating right can it achieve some kind of positive response from prospects otherwise you may become simply a trading partner but then again you know when you are trading something with some other country the other importer the importer company has lot of destinations from where they can buy that stuff from right so it's not 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 very uh, easy to answer you know, not very easy to take a plunge otherwise we would have like take example a simple shoe no we have enough leather right but the point is the companies which are located in take example agra are they ready to export no they may be ready to export as a commodity they do that right but are they able to brand it so but they are not able to brand it because branding would require okay a cutting edge design and then creating some kind of symbolism right but we may be good in terms of designing but we may lack in terms of creating symbolism and aura about the product right so you need to have preparedness in terms of all kinds of uh, angles then you can take plunge so prepare yourself in terms of your products in terms of your practices in terms of your ability to serve your client maybe financial debt because the money doesn't come immediately maybe 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 in terms of compliance to the uh, 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 the, the processes and legal framework you know can you comply with that right so these are some of the ideas which come to my mind when it comes uh, when it comes to taking uh, looking at the readiness thank you thank you so much sir you raised uh, quite a few pertinent points here um this brings me to my next question for which i would like to come back to dr prasad so what entry strategies can indian companies adopt to enter a market 
And what are some of the market entry barriers that Indian companies are likely to face while exporting a product to a particular market? Can you please explain using some examples? Okay, thank you, Nikar. So in the meantime, there are also uh, questions being raised in the chat. I was also going through them. Okay, so some of the questions we will keep answering uh, during uh, our, you know, while we speak. But this is a pretty interesting question that what are some of the entry strategies? And, and as the theme of our today's webinar goes, market entry strategies for exports. Uh, in fact, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, modify the topic because exporting itself is one of the market entry strategy. This is not, ex you know, exporting is only one of the strategies. So international engagement for a business starts with exporting. And that too can start with indirect exporting, not directly exporting. Because direct exporting requires some, some commitment of time, energy, effort, et cetera. And, and you know, I may still end up uh, with a risky proposition, may end up making losses because there are risks that all of you exporters must be aware of when you go international. As Professor Harsh Verma was talking about the political climate, the countries themselves can be risky. How many of you would like to go to a country like Syria, <laughs> you know, or, or North Korea? <laughs> so, you know, not many people. Countries themselves pose a risk. Culturally, there is a risk because the way things happen here and somebody is asking uh, one person, uh, Shubham, that, sir, what should be the checklist for retail foods if I want to take that abroad? Then, you know, the most interesting thing, as Professor Harsh Verma said, export readiness. That, you know, simply because I have a food, let's say Balaji wafers as a brand. Now, this may be an interesting, great brand in India. But will Balaji, as by that name, be acceptable there? And if no, then I have to invest in branding. And that brand name must go well gel well with that culture, the host country's culture. And if we don't brand as he has already emphasized on that aspect, then we export commodities and commodities don't fetch a high, that great value realization. You know, we sell at lower prices and we short change ourselves. Very close to my IFT campus here in Kolkata, there is a leather complex and ton truck loads of leather containers full of leather you know, goes to uh, even countries like Italy, little processing there and it gets a stamped labeled as finest Italian leather. And that same piece of leather, if I, it finds a way back into India or in some, you know, other, in the form of other products, say Louis Vuitton purses or whatever, then you see what, what premium we pay for that. But, but Nikhar, I won't talk much on that today because uh, today we'll let us focus only on where and the entry part. Uh, you know, uh, we need to be taking care, uh, first of all, because it's like ripple effect. So those who have no experience of going international, uh, ripple effect, I'm sure everybody understands, like, you know, you throw a small pebble into the still pond of water. So same way, you know, concentric circle way. So if I have no experience, maybe I can try indirect exporting. I may utilize the services of uh, experienced expert uh, trading houses or export houses like Adani Superstar Trading House. But then I don't earn much there. They earn because they know the market. And since the session is about market, you know, it's not about products. If you identify your markets well, and if you use the right entry strategy, fantastic, you can earn any kind of uh, margins or, you know, profits. It's pretty interesting. Arrow as a brand of shirt in India, U.S. brand it is, but U.S. it doesn't ship, doesn't manufacture, doesn't stitch any shirt and, you know, use ship logistics to send that shirt all the way to India and then we buy that. No, it doesn't happen. So it's pretty interesting that simply licensing of the brand by them. Now, this is an entry strategy, licensing. Okay, in, in which, you know, there is a contract they have with Arvind Brands. 
and Arvind supplies fabric. Arvind then uh, gets some stitched in India and some in Bangladesh because that's more competitive and uh, affordable or less expensive. And this is how, and without exporting even a single shirt, uh, Arrow, you know, is a still great American shirt. <laughs> Uh, all donkey work, all, all. So I think, you know, carefully choosing the entry strategy is, friends, very, very important and interesting. Okay. And, and we need to be careful about it as to what should be the entry strategy. Well, that depends on the exporters, the business's aspirations, the, the goals. Why are you going global? The resources that you have. If you don't have much resources and if you want to, test the water before you boil the rice, maybe you use a route like e-commerce or something to begin with. And somebody is asking me, the punker is asking, you know, in the chat, whether D2C is a preferable mode today, direct to consumer. Well, yes, but before D2C, one can use e-commerce. I know you might have to pay hefty, uh, you know, uh, charges to companies like Amazon, they do run a global selling program or things like that. But but before you go D2C, where, you know, fulfilling the order and accepting payments, you run less commercial risks in, in that case, you can try with that. So going, uh, you know, systematically as part of exporting, I'm saying start indirect exporting test the water, check the country, check the consumer behavior, understand that. And then slowly you can go D2C, you can do direct marketing, traditional way, you can find an overseas agent or a buyer, you can then get into franchising or licensing or something like that if you want to set up a retail chain or whatever. And then there can be a time. And if you have the resources deep pocket, then maybe you can make an investment you can you can acquire. Uh, Tata has acquired it Italy that way. Uh, mergers and acquisitions. Most of the MNCs when they entered India and you know they also did some kind of a strategic alliance, distribution alliance, because you need distribution network. No, so somebody uh, answering this question again on retail chain and all. If the retail, the food retail business, if you are branding it that way, if you have studied the taste and preferences of the consumers in that market, if you have understood what will go well, yeah. Even Heinz made a mistake in their food business, ketchup, tomato ketchup. When they entered China, they realized that oh, Chinese they don't consume as much tomato sauce as as the soy sauce. In Indonesia, they discovered that, you know, the more sauce is banana. And in India, the way we eat sauce, even with the paratha, paratha or whatever. Okay. And even after the, you know, they, they put it on pizza base, but we also put, can put it on the pizza toppings and everything. So even the MNCs, they learned. So I think, you know, there is no clear cut answer. Uh, it's, it's, but there is an answer that, okay, if I have, if I don't want to risk much, if I don't want to suffer, if I want to go systematic, you can start with e-commerce, go D2C, go direct, can then try contracting methods, uh, licensing, franchising, maybe a JV, 50-50 or whatever percentage. And then if you really know the market very well, and if you think that your assets are not going to be misappropriated or something like that, in that case, either a greenfield investment or a brownfield, you can actually get into that market. But, but I recommend that you must go systematically in that way. Uh, exporting is only one of the strategies, is, is not the, um, is, you know, exporting itself is not the only marketing strategy. Yeah, and, and let's, let's, because uh, both of myself and Professor Harsh Varma, we are uh, teachers of marketing, so, we would like to, because exporting is like selling and there, you know, unnecessary obsession with the product happens. So whatever product that we have, let's not try to push that. Let me tell you, uh, that's, uh, that's like marketing myopia. We first need to be understanding the pain points of that market and then adapt to the product because standardization doesn't work well in most of the product categories, particularly food and fashion and these kinds of things. 
okay my lab yes testing kits you may standardize but but in certain product categories we need to adapt to the local taste and therefore as part of our export readiness also we must take care of this aspect i am trying to say that we can think global but we have to act local and and also as i talked about e commerce d2c uh, we have to go digital today because because traditional exporting where a freight forwarder will only make the arrangement for shipping the cargo and i think that's not the way today business is done and somebody hitesh uh, batra is asking uh, in the chat that you know i tried on linkedin and trade map and no one has you know shown interest so far and it's about furniture plastic furniture products and the question is whether you know nobody else nobody else has market only china has monopoly well it is nobody has monopoly in the globalized world today neither china nor us nor anybody else uh, anyone can any time crack the market it's all about quality it's all about consumer acceptance if you see trade maps you will find where all the are the importing countries for plastic or all the types of products if you know the hs codes well you can search there and you will know where your product has the potential data is there today so i suggest to that all your market selection should be data backed research backed and not on gut feel i i'm sure many of you will endorse that we happen to select markets only on the basis of some obvious contacts somewhere mere bhai ka koi dost wahan rehta hai usne you know something like that now if that's the way we have been engaging with the international market then we only push the product and are okay with push you know selling one or two container lots but if you are strategizing for long term success and relationship and and if you really aspire to be a global company today which is possible because of technology and a hell lot of resources which are available today i am sure you must be thinking curative marketing first look at the market and what problems they suffer okay then think how your product can solve that and if your product falls short please augment your product do something to your product and also brand it and take it in the right way and enter that market with the right entry strategy so so let me emphasize on the keyword right market and right market entry strategy they are key to success otherwise you know we are likely to make a mistake nikhar i am done if you want to i can <laughs> thank you so much sir you already set the context for my uh, next question um in the light of this discussion uh, which revolved around e-commerce and uh, you know the opportunities that exist in a globalized world i would like to come to uh, ms priyanka shah co-founder expora for some live industry case study uh, expora is an uh, online platform which caters to different uh, segments like the food and beverage of apparel and textiles gems and jewelry and personal care and beauty segments Today, Ms. Shah is here to talk about how e-commerce can be used as a strategy to enhance the brand's global presence. And uh, in this context, I would like to ask you: In your experience, how can Indian exporters leverage e-commerce to successfully cultivate a cross-border clientele? And can you please explain what pros and cons this business model or market entry strategy has vis-a-vis -a, -vis a traditional retail one? yes uh, thank you nakar so <clears throat> thank you for the introduction so i think i would just want to start by saying you know that i think e-commerce has had like a uh, you know really long history in when it comes to changing how traditional businesses work right so uh, i think it's played a very important role in leveling the um, you know a playing field across different industries and across different geographies so i think if i try to divide that i think there have been like 
a three kinds of uh, you know revolutions as i may call it you know in this industry so while uh, i think e-commerce 1.0 was you know when the amazons and the flipkarts of the world kind of came in and changed the way you know the b2c industry worked so i think you know that's kind of made all of our lives you know uh, very easy so i think all of us kind of experience it uh, in different ways and modes in every day right i think the second wave kind of came in in the b2b space interestingly and i think even in india i think now all of us would have you know heard of companies like um Udan, we've heard of companies like Farm Easy, so you know, uh, which is into pharma, uh, you know, space. We've heard of Infra Market, which is into construction material. There is off business. There is that work into this, you know, industrial uh, heavy machinery, etc. So the point is that you know these companies are also trying to use uh, technology, right, in order to uh, change and create more efficiencies and you know, kind of organize the unorganized markets. in india today right um so i think cat explora what we are actually trying to create is the 3.0 wave when it comes to you know using e-commerce uh, to promote um, you know cross border trade right so i think uh, that was the whole idea you know for starting explora that how do we leverage you know e-commerce to uh, create different kind of um, you know experience in the entire uh, you know a cross border a uh, trade industry so i think that was just to set some uh, broad context right so i think when it comes to understanding the differences between uh, running you know like a traditional um, you know exports business vis-a-vis say or uh, e-commerce um, you know business um, i think obviously there are a lot of pros uh, similar to you know how a b2c um, you know industry has gotten a lot of convenience um, you know options opportunities in the b2c world so if i was to just cover a few of them right i think uh, what it can provide you know is like a one stop uh, destination for uh, you know a lot of options you know like in terms of visibility uh, that a platform can get right so while physically or traditionally people you know would travel and meet and you know uh, they could give in an x number of products um, you know to people uh, in e-commerce i think the way we have seen in b2c you can have a lot more aggregation done uh, so that you can have a one stop solution for a lot of needs of you know different kind of buyers i think secondly there is a chance to have a lot better brand visibility so when i'm saying brand i just don't typically mean a brand just like your um, you know hiney can etc i mean company as a brand itself right so any type of a supplier it could be a manufacturer a trader or a brand um, you know like a packaged food brand etc uh, who can actually try to you know make their presence felt across different geographies because as again we know traveling to uh, every single country as you said right i mean the 200 plus countries in the world so you cannot really physically go and try to establish your brand like everywhere um i think your yeah, e-commerce will play a very important role in making your presence felt you know across different geographies um so you know because there are no geographical boundaries um you know as such i think thirdly there is a lot of better scope of you know targeted communication so i think it kind of also ties up with a fact um, you know like a point which um, uh, professor rp sharma had raised that you know there is a lot of need of this data driven decision making which i i mean that was one of the key insights we've also gotten as a company because traditionally people uh, are very relationship driven so they actually try to find their relatives friends you know and then start doing their businesses so the point here is that if you use the data so i think what we've also realized is that you know there is a lot of Uh, uh platforms which are giving you data right so there is a uh, dollar data there is exim uh, data there is a lot of this different platform which have come up i think what's really lacking is um, you know like a tool or a platform which helps you use that data more efficiently right so people are not able to consume data in a manner which can help them in better you know decision making um so while i think in i'll try to cover you know later about how explora is trying to do that but i think uh with the right kind of data you can do a much better targeted uh um, you know uh entry strategy has been mentioning right so i think uh, using technology right so i'm not just referring to e-commerce just as the typical uh, marketplace model that you are you know or that people might of thinking about i am just trying to say that how can technology as a whole whether it's e-commerce or whether there are a lot of different aspects of technology uh, how can technology as a whole you know actually help you um, you know in a better uh, entry strategy covering both your where and your how right so and i think lastly i think there's also a lot of transparency which can kind of come into the entire b2b domain because your order tracking you know understanding because i think when it's cross border that's even more important right whether in a b2c within your country it's still easier you know to know that it will come but then i think in a cross border b2b that's kind of super important you know to track 
where is your order at because a few countries have like um, you know time gap of like a month or two just for it to get delivered so i think there's it's very kind of important to have a transparent visibility into the entire supply chain at large so i think across you know getting more discoverability getting more transparency uh, you know getting better profit margins um, you know a lot of this can be achieved if we use technology in the right way and um, you know hence we believe that um, you know technology and e-commerce are kind of the way to go uh, you know for this entire new era for the 3.0 you know transformation while definitely i think what i would want to also highlight i think the biggest con if i may call right is is the lack of physical presence or you know the trust deficit which might come in if you are only an e-commerce platform right because i think in b2b trust is the key so if you don't build trust you will not be able to trade so you know maybe like a few categories like handicraft home decor furnishings might still allow people to completely you know or transact online i think a lot many categories like the way we also deal in uh, whether it's jewelry for example right i don't really feel a jewelry business can just be done online i mean you will need an element of physical presence you will have to build your trust uh, before you can actually scale up so maybe few transactions are possible so i think the biggest advantage of a traditional business is you know in the the physical presence and the effort and the time they put in building relationships and hence i feel that overall if to summarize right i think the uh, the next wave will be driven by a omni channel approach right so while people should leverage e-commerce for its own benefits and you know technology for its own benefits we cannot do away with the physical presence and you know the relationship building that the traditional um, you know uh, re retailers or wholesalers or exporters you know are today trying to engage in so i think yeah, for us i think at expora also we believe and overall i think that would be my suggestion also that you know having an omni channel strategy might be the next um, you know kind of wave of maybe global trade and yeah we are trying to do our bit you know to achieve the same that is a very valid point that you made about omni channel presence uh this brings me to my next question what challenges do indian brands and suppliers face when they are uh, in international markets and how can tech platforms like expora help solve such concerns so i think um, you know i'll quickly just start by you know highlighting and i think luckily a lot of the discussions today which have happened kind of tie up to uh, the question that you are asking right so i think today we'll we just talk quickly try to analyze what are the challenges that brands or traders or um, you know retailers in india are trying to face if they were to export right or if they were to have their physical presence felt so i think the first thing as i said you know is the lack of trust on the both the sides right so if it's a new uh, brand or a supplier etc they will face a lot of challenge or resistance you know in terms of getting their presence felt in the different geographies because even the buyers would want some credibility they would want you know certain um a kind of a com comfort before they actually start you know trading with you uh, quite well so i think a trust deficit i believe is the is the major thing you know because of which a lot of trade kind of fails to happen because there's a lack of trust right so it could be for uh, any reason which were discussed right it could be some political issues with the country it could be many many more i think which were already covered i think the second thing which is kind of lacking you know is the is a lack of bandwidth so i think at expora for example we've also actually tied up with of uh, brands which are listed in the indian um, you know um, uh, markets actually but are still tying up with us to have their presence felt because they lack bandwidth so every time it is not about money or you know capital it is a lot of times we realize about bandwidth because india itself is such a huge opportunity that even the bigger companies don't have the bandwidth uh, to you know actually make their presence felt globally so um you know i think the lack of bandwidth is another key challenge that we have kind of analyzed uh, the third you know of course is the lack of capital so a lot of times because a lot of their working capital is utilized for uh, catering to their indian businesses they don't have enough capital to then you know cater to the export market because that will also require some uh, uh, you know investment right if you have to also start making your presence felt i think the fourth would be the lack of also expertise sometimes right so which is uh you know identifying the right markets you know what we've been covering so whether it is where to sell how to sell sometimes also what to sell so you know i think all of these questions are something a lot of people are kind of confused in uh, right that about how do they get answers to you know uh, these kind of questions and i think lastly uh, i think the fifth leg is that of compliance so i think again it was kind of i think in some of the questions that i just read um they were also trying to say that it's very challenging to understand what are the different regulations of different countries they all require a different set of documents uh, there will be different compliances or you know certifications that you would need before you can enter those markets so i think you know these are a lot of uh, barriers for people to actually engage you know into exports or for the existing exporters to scale 
right so i think these were the broad four five points that we as explorer had kind of identified in like our journey so now quickly coming to how are we trying to solve for these right so explora is basically a, a you know a global a b2b trade platform where we are trying to launch global hubs which can provide import and export as a service so we have three hubs for now so we are headquartered in bombay uh, in india of course Uh, so that's our major hub uh, we've also set up our two offices in dubai we also have a uh, office in the us so what we are trying to do is that we are trying to have these hubs which can promote different lines of you know businesses across the globe so we want to engage both into imports and exports uh, because we've also realized that you know just working one way into exports will also not work because any country so um uh, i think you know luckily when uh, mr uh, you know professor rp was also talking about africa as a market right so uh, luckily for explora that so i'm actually traveling to east africa just next week uh, because we believe that it's a great you know market to kind of tap or you know to capture but we've also uh, um, you know understood that there's a lot of scope for uh, you know imports into india from there or even re exports to other countries so i think for example us has created a lot of good um, you know duty structures for africa so a lot of re exports for africa duty free into us like for as for example so what we have realized is that you know like we want to try and figure out these uh, different hubs which can help promote you know import and exports so what we are trying to suggest is again you know linking with so i'm very glad a lot of my points were covered because uh, you know indirect exports again you know what i think again a professor was covering you know so explora could be a great platform again for people to engage into indirect exports because what we are saying is that you know we can locally buy from suppliers suppliers brands traders you know in india we can locally sell into the countries wherever we have launched our base because you know dubai is like a great base for the entire mina region at large so it's not just dubai whether it's africa you know the entire gulf saudi again you know we have realized is a very very growing market this is our uh, you know uh, research as well so the point is that we will deal with them locally there we can engage with suppliers locally here and everything else in the between will be managed by us so then whether it's compliance whether it's logistics um, you know uh, we are there to look into it end to end so um, you know broadly what we are trying to do is we want to eliminate the trust deficit Uh, which is existing on both the supplier and the buyer side because what we have realized is that um, you know like again if it's a 1.0 2.0 or 3.0 journey the 1.0 journey was like the um, you know the india in the india um, you know match of the world where you are able to go to the platform and you know it's like a yellow page which is there for you online that's when the first wave of digitalization started second wave we have a lot of companies which have again in the startup world kind of come up which are trying to be marketplaces right which are connecting people at least taking more responsibility and ownership and trying to you know facilitate the trade when it comes to explora we are actively a part of the trade right so we buy and sell uh so we want to be a uh, traders ourselves and we want to be a part of this entire ecosystem so that the trust element kind of remains you know on either sides uh, of the table basically um so i think uh, and our major lever right is technology so uh, we've also gotten someone very senior from amazon you know who is helping us build this entire platform where the entire procure to pay cycle can be managed through our platform basically um so luckily we so we are in, actually building different pieces right so building our own erp system which we are calling as explora os uh, you know so the way you have your android and your ios we are trying to create something very specific for exports uh, which we are calling as you know explora os basically uh, secondly we are also building something very interesting which is the explora trade insights model so you know just linking it back uh, to the you know the data driven decision making approach so we are trying to use whatever our data that is available right through exim uh, through um, you know dollar business and couple of these other websites we are trying to put certain algorithms uh, you know put certain more thought into how to use that data to make better decision so even for my africa trip right we have tried to collate a lot of different uh, data or uh, try to set up meetings accordingly you know try to identify our product lines accordingly you know because we are as of now we are into three categories we are into agro food uh, we are into textiles we are also into jewelry so for us to also identify what in each right because agro food itself is like a mammoth a uh, you know category so uh, identification of what to sell where to sell how to sell is kind of the key so we are also trying to use that uh, you know to make better decisions so basically what that means is that anyone associated with us also uh, will be able to gain insights uh, using the tools and the platforms that you know we are trying to build um so i think yeah, all in all i think i would just want to uh, summarize that uh, at explora we want to become the trusted partner you know in the global trade ecosystem uh, with the trading hubs that you know we are trying to launch and yeah i hope that you know even in this forum if there are people we could uh, try and you know associate it 
uh, with it would be great uh, because we have started with these three categories but ultimately we aim to be like a horizontal platform so then whether it's chemicals or whether it's handicrafts uh, we would want to be uh, there all but of course it would be like a, a gradual journey so you know the way alibaba kind of changed the entire chinese economy and put china on the global map uh, we would want to do the same for india so i hope we yeah, have we can uh, work together with you all and achieve our uh, mission so yeah thank you Thank you so much for uh, your insights, uh, Priyanka, and uh, good luck with that vision. Um, I would now like to move to Mr. Devarshi Bey, uh, Marketing Director, MyLab Discovery Solutions, a dynamic uh, biotechnology company that develops and commercializes diagnostic kits to empower labs to uh, obtain actionable answers. Mr. Day is here today with us to help us understand how the company is disseminating their solutions to other parts of the world. So, what role did market diversification play in boosting MyLab's sales over the years? Yeah, thank you, Nikar, and uh, well, thank you for uh, you know inviting to this session to be pre in presence of Dr. Sharma, Dr. Verma. You know, it's a great honor to be present here and talking amongst you. Thank you, Priyanka. It was a great insight. In fact. When we talk about uh, trade, and uh, that is something which is the need of the hour, because we need to expand our trading boundaries and uh, you know uh, see where we can reach to the vision that uh, our uh, honorable prime minister has seen for what we want to do for India. Uh, talking about my lab, you know, my lab discovery solutions. We begin with an idea to simplify the complex nature of disease detection, making it more affordable and bringing cutting edge science and technology to everyday detection. That is what was the idea which we started with. And with that idea of affordable diagnostics, today we are planning to enter into the healthcare space and to enable diagnostics uh, in the hand of the people. You know, talking a bit about this healthcare industry, the Indian healthcare industry is experiencing a rapid change and has become one of uh, India's largest sector today, uh, uh, especially after pandemic, uh, both in terms of revenue and uh, employment. The Indian healthcare sector is expected uh, to, you know, grow a record of threefold rise. Uh, growing at a CSGR of 22% between 2016 to 2022, uh, recorded recently. And it is expected to reach to a US billion dollars of around $372 billion by next year, compared to what it was just $110 billion at 2016-17 per se. Now, having said that, when we talk about uh, such growth and opportunities in healthcare industry, one of the most challenging decisions for a company is to confront is when they have to diversify, you know, uh, whether or not the rewards and risk can be extraordinary, but then there is always a decision what to do in case of this. Now, the main reason why a company wants to diversify is to minimize or, you know, the chances of downturn in a sector, increase the ROI pro or provide a wider a variety of alternatives in terms of products and service offering. Uh, Typically, we, when we talk about my lab, you know, we were a diagnostic segment and we were in a very niche segment when we call about diagnostic is a molecular diagnostics. Uh, to, to, be, to be very talk, very simplify this entire term of molecular diagnostics, we know today uh, the RT-PCR test. So we were uh, one of the first manufacturers in India to go with uh, these kind of RT-PCR test manufacturing. And uh, amongst us, there were a few other manufacturers which are also doing very well in this sector. Uh, uh, and you know, from here, when we saw that during the pandemic came, uh, there we needed some kind of diversification because molecular diagnostics, even though if I say that it is very accurate, it is very sensitive, it gives you result within uh, three to four hours and it is very appropriate when we talk about disease detection and disease testing. You know, uh, India, when we talk about India per se, you know, the healthcare system is significantly lagged compared to those of the peer nations. Now, uh, quite some time, the economic planners regarding uh, always have regarded the India healthcare expenditure as financially non-productive, uh, social, and, you know, the spendings have been very minuscule, poorly uh, resourced and you know the public healthcare sectors are also very uh, or not developed in a case. So when we talk about this, the healthcare industry, when you talk about the uh, larger scale, the the world's largest and fastest growing industry, 
consuming around 9.1% of the GDP globally, but India spends just 1.3%. So when we talk about these figures, one of the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing that we came into our mind is diversification is why don't we apply an economical way of testing so that, you know, people sitting at home who were not able to do this kind of test, which were very costly, like RT-PCR test, you know, give them the ability to do the testing at home itself. So over recent years, you know, access to self-testing kits, uh, which is a part of direct-to-consumer testing, uh, there was a question. So self-testing kit is a part of a direct-to-consumer testing market, and it has been expanding globally. Uh, it has been present since quite some time, and uh, what happens typically, this test can be purchased from a pharmacy, and it can be performed at home, and you do not need any uh, healthcare professional to be present. Uh, so there are two different types, like you can do it at home, see the result and conclude yourself or uh, just take the sample at home and send it to the labs and uh, wait for the report, what kind of report has been given to you. So uh, self-testing kit was one of the uh, uh, avenues where we decided to expand and diversify. So it was kind of an horizontal diversification, we can call about it. Uh, that was one of the ways, but Apart from that, there were a few other products when we saw that, you know, when we could reach out to the people uh, with this, we saw that even we could reach out to the last mile. So talking about different rural areas, uh, uh, the, the, the kit was present in different places in the pharmacies and in, 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 I would say that it was present in each and every pin code of India. So when we saw that, you know, this is something which is empowering the people, which is helping themselves to do the test at home, why not come out with different ways and avenues and different technologies which can be really helpful so another way that we did was you know developed uh, sensor based technology testing uh, devices so uh, we we now one of the major problems when we talk about diagnostics is you know regulatories uh, when we talk about diseases like covid or let's say you know detecting uh, influenza or malaria uh, chikungunya, HIV, HCV, these are very uh, dangerous diseases. These are transferable disease, uh, diseases, like respiratory diseases are, it can be, you know, transferred uh, if not done uh, properly. Even though we have uh, 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 taken utmost precautions when we do the self-test kit, uh, self-test, it doesn't get transferred from one person to another because uh, we do, uh, uh, we, we have a very special chemical which deactivates the virus, but, you know, there are avenues where you can uh, do the test. So uh, we have, we are also expanded into designing devices which are helpful, designing devices which could be, uh, which they can do different tests, which today they have to wait for like 48 hours or 72 hours to get the report. So reaching out to the last mile with instrumentation, reaching out to the last mile with self-testing kit, reaching out to the last mile with uh, sensor-based testing devices, which are easily available, which could be easily available uh, to the market. So this was the way of uh, diversification that we did into horizontal diversification. And uh, till now, I think we have got a very good response from, uh, uh, from the consumer market. And hopefully, uh, as we were pre-discussing, we could be able to uh, see a position where we could make things very much affordable for the masses. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dave, for sharing such interesting uh, insights about horizontal market diversification and how innovation and uh, regulation came into play in, during this whole uh, scenario. Uh, what market entry strategies did you adopt and uh, what roles uh, do government and export promotion councils in the country have in helping domestic players boost their overseas, uh, overseas sales? So uh, I think uh, you are in a position to answer since uh, you've been collaborating with PGCI. So if you like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, see, most of the, uh, uh, in fact, Professor Sarma has already discussed this in this forum that, you know, uh, there are many market entry strategies which can be adopted by a lot of uh, new players coming in. Now, selling a product in international market requires very precise planning and, you know, maintenance processes because, because that is what will help to stay organized before, during and after entering the new market. Now, every company has its own goal for, uh, uh, you know, for, for the entry and, and entering into the international market. And there are different strategies, like if you talk about 
counter trading can be a very good strategy. Now, counter trading is a cost effective choice for many businesses because uh, uh, that is where they practice and they can be exempted from uh, many uh, import quotas. You know, it's a trade involving the exchange of goods or service for any other goods uh, or services from counterpart. To give you an example, now if you remember, uh, Malaysia is the world's second largest producer of palm oil. And in, addi in addition to that, Malaysia has entered into the barter trade agreement with a handful of nations where they acquire large infrastructure and, uh, uh, you know, uh, some military equipments or supersonic planes and uh, all these things in barter, bartering with the palm oil. So, for example, Malaysia received like 18, uh, 18 uh, MiG-29 uh, fighter jets from Russia in 94 as a part of an offset deal. So, uh, these are some of uh, the kinds of counter uh, sorry, sorry, uh, counter trading ways where uh, uh, they can be a marketing strategy. Then there can be piggy banking, for example. So, uh, example, a car company can promote another company's tires. You know, in such situation, the products are complementary because car need wheels. And, uh, you know, in that way, they, they do not go, uh, they, they do not go into competition with each other and more likely, you know, they can have, a, a, you know, different uh, uh, entry strategies when we are going, uh, trying to set up our, ourselves into different companies. There can be licensing can be a way where, you know, we can enter into different market. Then joint ventures can be another way where we can jointly work together with different companies and, you know, uh, collaboratively develop the product and it can be marketed in both the countries, uh, company ownerships, franchising, outsourcing. There are so many ways. We typically have adopted the export because uh, Professor Sarma correctly said that export is the way uh, where we should first go. And uh, even though, you know, when we talk about different avenues, there are risks involved and Professor Verma currently said that first you gorge yourself, whether are you ready to swim with the sharks, you know. So if that is not the condition, then export is the best possible way because you have control over your product. You know how good a product is. You know how efficient a product is. You have evaluated the product. You have done all the validation of the product. And if you have a little better advantage, over the competition in the outer world, then it's the best way is to go out and, you know, export the product. So when we talk about exporting, yes, Indian government has been very supportive uh, and uh, uh, many, many organizations have been supportive, especially Trade Promotion Council of India. Uh, you have given us this opportunity to present a platform where we could uh, go to, I think, Russia recently. And then we, and, it, and our company was very well accepted and appreciated because, the, uh, see, typically my lab, when we talk about uh, Professor uh, Varma currently said that, you know, India needs to establish itself uh, globally, you know, like as as he said that you know France is known for perfumes and Italy is known for craftsmanship, and China is known for you know uh, uh, sourcing of raw materials or chips, and Japan is known for what is India exactly known for? Probably in coming years we will get to know what India would be known for. But we are trying to create an environment where innovation should be a paramount importance when we try to develop a product. You know, we have a lot of, we have brilliant minds in India. You know, we are collaborating, like my lab is collaborating with, uh, 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 or with IITs and we are collaborating with BHUs and we are collaborating with different other uh, research institutes in India. And we are trying to find out what is the best possible way where we do not reduce the quality, but get the best product out in the market, you know? So, because when we talk about an economical product, a cheap product, people might think that it might be not of a good quality. You know, there is not sustainability in the product. You know, there would be a batch to batch variation. And in healthcare, you cannot do that. In healthcare, it's the the most important thing is the is the life of a person that will help to determine. Like my test, which goes out in the market, if I say that yes, this person is positive because of certain disease, there are certain implications on his mind, and uh, he he or she will be diagnosed accordingly. So that has to be very accurate. That has to be uh, very much effective enough so that the uh, correct decision is taken and you know an appropriate dosage of treatment follows after that so uh, uh, that is how we are planning you know export is the best possible way we have been exporting to a lot of different countries yes there are certain export uh, barriers 
because regulation is uh, the thing which we need to comply with. Uh, medical regulations, uh, in vitro diagnostic device regulations of different countries are different. Uh, we have to match up to their expectations. We have to submit our kits and get entry into it. It typically takes a lot of time, uh, some around six to eight months for the different government agencies to accept, uh, do the test and you know conquer with the results that we have and come in accord with whatever reports we are submitting. Uh, uh, yes, Africa is a very good market. I would say, unfortunately, uh, Africa doesn't have money. <laughs> so as uh, Professor Sarma said that, you know, Africa is the best market to do. So what typically happens when the disease burden in Africa is typically taken care by either WHO or NACO or Red Cross or some other bodies right. and getting through to, uh, an approval to these bodies is a little bit tough because there is always, you know, a prejudiced mind. So if when I'm talking about WHO, they would be more prejudiced towards uh, uh, company manufacturers which are present there. Uh, recently, after COVID, we have seen a lot of mentality changes where they are accepting our products and uh, our products have got into evaluation and it was, and uh, to be very frank with you, uh, we, uh, one of the, uh, biggest uh, burden of disease in India that we have is TB and we have got accepted for TB uh, program. So one of us, so we have an end-to-end -end program solution for eradication of TB, helping the uh, eradication of TB program. And that's a global uh, program which is running. WHO has really appreciated the kind of products that we have and uh, they want us to be included and, uh, you know, reduce the global burden. So th that is one thing. Uh, Talking about the developed countries, yes, developed countries, even though there's a very good money out there, but then the major problem is regulatory of the regulatory of that region. So if we want to sell in US, we have to spend a huge amount of money to get the regulatory clearance of that country. And that typically takes two to three years. So uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, these in, uh, the different avenues or the different strategies of entry that we have adopted. We have adopted the simplest strategy that is uh, export. And uh, yes, trade councils of India, different bodies have been really very helpful. And this is needed actually. Uh, like the, the best part of Trade Promotion Council of India is you identify the manufacturers, the budding startups, and you give them the platform, which is really helpful. And uh, I think uh, that is what you should do, continue uh, doing so and help such new startups to, you know, really expand and give them the platform to network with different uh, manufacturers and different countries so that, you know, they can promote their products and really, uh, you know, come in at par with the vision of what our Honorable Prime Minister really sees us doing. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Dave. Firstly, that uh, your solutions are being accepted for uh, TB by WHO. And thank you so much for sharing such interesting insights and, uh, you know, how, on how businesses can grow their international presence. Uh, building on this, I would now like to come to uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Sharma once again. And uh, sir, can you please uh, cite some examples of successful market diversification by MNCs and what Indian companies can learn from them? Okay, so probably this is the last question before we answer some of the questions in the Q&A that they have raised. Uh, well, uh, first thing first, uh, if, if you talk of MNCs, let's start from a small country like Japan, 1945, completely devastated, just before the time we got independence. And you see today, how many global brands they have contributed. Uh, even if I talk of one category, air conditioners, Hitachi, Daikin, O General, Panasonic, Mitsubishi, there are several names and they never thought, you know, uh, that these products should be taken uh, or marketed only within their own country. So it's all about the mindset. So I'm also addressing the second question that what can Indian companies learn from this? Please learn the biggest thing, attitude. That don't think short term, you know, it takes time. Even Mr. Devarshi Day has been talking about that compliance is meeting those regulatory requirements. It may take two years, three years, whatever. It doesn't matter. You have to do it only once. 
product registration in a particular country. So please make that effort because you are looking at that market forever. This is the first lesson that we must learn. Have patience, have perseverance, have the right mental attitude of helping the foreign buyer, the customer there. If I only have a selfish, uh, self-obsessed motive of making some profit by supplying something as, as a transaction, then I don't think you should even look at exports, guys. Okay, this I'm being loud and clear and I'm naming Japan. They have nothing, nothing precisely, no natural resources, no minerals, nothing. But still see how they have created. And marketing, second lesson, important lesson, that commodities will not work. Traditionally, we have been shipping commodities. Let me go to the extent of saying it's a crime. <laughs> we have wonderful products. Simple, you, we create value, then why not communicate that value? You know, what is holding us back? And we'll guide you. TPCI, IFT, Professor Varma will guide you how to, how to create that value proposition and communicate that value proposition of every product in every single market. Third, second important lesson. Third important lesson that any product you take to any market, please make that product applicable to that market. So let's not be ethnocentric, you know, because Indian product and it should be marketed the same way there. No, it may have different application there. Isab goal, Sat Isab goal. And you see, a lot of companies, uh, you know, they market it as uh, wellness, nutrition, anti-constipation. That's a problem that the world is suffering. And, and it's wonderfully, you know, because and nobody buys it here. India is known for several things. Services, medical, tourism, IT, we already have a name and everything. Wellness, Ayush, everything, I think we can do that there also pretty well. So I think it's about making products applicable. It's making products affordable, pricing sensibly. I'm not saying that price lower than China, but I don't think people are looking for cheaper prices. People are looking for com competitive products which, have, uh, which can deliver better value. And then the third thing is that we need to be available there. So we need to ensure availability. Whether you use e-commerce or B2B platforms, or you have a distribution point there, or you tie up with the retail chains abroad, Target, Tesco, Walmart, I don't know. There are several routes, or you enter into licensing or JV. Well, that depends. But if we have to take the first step, it has to start with either e-commerce or indirect exports, and then you know you can go to direct. And so then, you know, we need to be available and we need to develop some kind of an affinity with that market. Okay, so not just branding, not just stopping at the branding level, but trying and creating an emotional connect with our products. Yeah, it's possible. Professor Harsh Varma in the introductory only said, Sundaram Fastener is, has been the sole supplier of radiator care caps to General Motors. General Motors, despite being such a big brand buyer, they did not look at anybody else. So in that case, if you reach that kind of a partnering stage, I think the attitude, the long-term thinking, making an investment into that market, making an effort to understand consumers, observing their behavior, sometimes traveling as Priyanka is now visiting East Africa, <laughs> And, and I think all these things, uh, they go a long way, uh, you know, in catering to those markets. Friends, you can also get in touch with Indian embassies in all those countries. Now there's a mandate that necessarily the first secretary commercial in the embassy, if they have to maintain their position there, they have to report, though they fall in Ministry of External Affairs, but they have to send a report to the uh, Commerce Ministry also as to how did they help in generating business, make in India and Atmanirbhar India. So, so, you know, if you write a mail to them, you will be surprised, rather delighted that they will respond because somebody is asking me, how do we identify uh, distributors? Gandharv, your, your question, Gandharv, you somewhere asked that for D2C, if we have to identify certain people, how do we do that? 
Well, today you can simply, simply, you know, if you do Google search, you will identify who are the, for example, in Dar es Salaam, if I want to know who are the distributors of medicinal products, you can get in, you know, and then you can write emails and even trade, uh, trade maps, databases, you can have that kind of information. And as Priyanka bridged the gap, you know, the, the trust deficit, whether the buyer is, can I trust, is the buyer credible, is the buyer verified, is the buyer genuine? If that's your concern, you can write to the embassy that these three parties from your city, country have shown interest in our products. Could you please do some verification at your end? Could you recommend someone? If you have a girl or girl, you ask them how the food is. Same way, you know, uh, this, and they, they happily do it today. Because I, we have, we have uh, a campus in uh, Africa and we, as part of Africa initiative of the government of India, we have done capacity building in several countries, Angola, Burkina Faso, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Tanzania, yeah, Zimbabwe, Zambia, most of these countries. I personally travel to these countries. All my colleagues, they do travel. So, you know, we do train uh, those people into uh, capacity building. The point is that it is possible. We can do that and they will help. These are some of, uh, you know, the, the things. We, th there is no shortcut. If you want to look, uh, if your aspirations are going global, then, then let's, let's make our products relevant to their needs. Let's invest some time and effort in understanding their requirements. Let's not uh, look at transactions, but building a relationship so that you know you can get repeat orders and also references and there are a lot of b2b portals so that you can join uh, go for worldbusiness.com expora is there and india mart is there and and somebody also asked vijaya lakshmi you said e-commerce does that help only in selling small quantities well b2c e-commerce is a relevant uh, uh, recently or relatively a newer phenomenon but in B2B, Alibaba and B2B, internet has been used right from beginning. Because just as you are looking for a market, somebody is also looking for sourcing from the best possible suppliers in the world, no? So those guys, they use internet for searching. So somebody rightly, you know, in the chat answered that I have been using LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, you know, you can engage with the procurement experts, uh, this social selling. But, but you need to develop right kind of content which can be engaging. And if they don't happen to see that, then you will have to send, share that with them in a private message and things like that. But there are ways. I think go digital and, and uh, learn from the MNCs, despite the fact that I may not have resources and deep pocket like an MNC, but that doesn't restrict my thought. I would like to say that having resources is not important. If you really want success in the global market, then being resourceful is more important. So not resources, but resourcefulness. TPCI, IIFT, uh, trade promotion councils, uh, uh, product councils, uh, embassies, they can help you become resourceful. And, and with that, uh, if you have any questions, uh, Dikhar, if you notice any question which have been unanswered, remaining unanswered, we can look at that. But but uh, we don't have to go the MNC way. I mean, it's we, we can still start uh, for right from the scratch and as a small company, it doesn't matter. You know, today a company can be born global. You don't even have to, because that question, uh, Professor Harsh Varma answered export readiness. And we have been talking about that, you know, only when I uh, am successful in the domestic market, I must look at a global market. You know, that used to be the premise earlier, but that's no more, uh, you know, because today, in fact, uh, right from the day one, somebody may look at that, okay, I don't know whether I will sell my product in India, but I, I will sell in India too, but it's for the global market. Well, you can do that. And, and there are so many formats and possibilities and for capacity building, you know, please don't hesitate. Uh, building skills, negotiating, uh, when to quote, how much to quote, how to negotiate, how to get that order. Uh, that is where I think you will need uh, professional expert help. Otherwise, uh, wish everyone the best of, uh, you know, the times and best of your capabilities because, because it is, uh, 
the centuries for India, and I think we can do drastically, uh, fantastically well if we just think and decide that you want to play long term. Right, so thank you so much for uh, these pearls of wisdom. I think you've given our exporters a lot to think about. Uh, with this, I will come just to one last question for Professor Harsh. Uh, so what are your quick thoughts on uh, the recent trends in consumer behavior that Indian exporters should watch out for? My answer is going to be very brief, right? See, there was a time when customers or consumers used to be stupid, right? Now, consumers are not stupid. They can see through you, right? So this is an era of transparency, right? So given this fact that, well, consumers are transparent, right? They are not only interested in your product, Right. They are interested in much more. So what I say is that, well, there used to be play of consciousness, but now there is emergence of conscience, which means that, well, uh, uh, as a customer, I'm beginning to attach importance to what goes behind the product in terms of processes, procurement, human relations, and so on. So not for the lower end, but if you really want to see, there is a commodity route which everybody talks about, right? But commodity route probably is not an aspirational route. It is the route of creating your own brand, right? So if you want to play out a game in international markets with your own metal, okay? So, the emerging trend is that, well, there are customer segments and pockets who are willing to pay price for, you know, not only excellent product, but what goes behind. So there is what is called now maybe fairness. So there is a market which is emerging in terms of fairness, whether the product is fair or not. There is market which is emerging in terms of whether the product is sustainable or not. Right. So this is one. Now I'm reminded of, you know, what Professor Sharma was talking about. I'm reminded of Ralph Waldo Emerson, right? So, and, and which, which is what uh, Frank is also seem to be doing is right. You know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson once upon a time said long time back, he said that, well, if you can, if you could develop a better mousetrap, if you could develop a better mousetrap or deliver a better sermon or write a better book, Notwithstanding, you make your home in woods, the world will make a beaten path to your door. So the point is, this is an era of discovery. It's very easy. So there was a time when there was no internet, right? there was no uh, what is called communication. You there were isolated pockets, right? But because of these technologies, discovery has become very easy. So if discovery, as a customer, just swap the position. So you are an exporter, right? You are an exporter, right? Swap the position, you are a customer, okay? You might be a customer who consumes. You might be a procurement person who is working for a company like Intel, right? And you're looking for chips. What's your concern? Your concern is that, well, my job depends on my company's job survival depends on how good am I. So I'm trying to discover where I can locate okay, the best product. So export, in my opinion, in, in, in the present situation will automatically happen if you're good. So, so, so develop a better product, like develop a better server, okay, you'll get some. So in terms of customer, at the same time, you know, customers are becoming fickle, you know. So if you look at, you know, the attorneys uh, in high courts, right, attorneys which deal with what you call divorces they are a busy lot sharmaji they are a busy lot right so there is fickle mindedness which is emerging right so we are becoming experimentative i'm sure there was the, the, the mr day has got a, a kit for testing the pregnancy right right and it will be doing yes. a big good good business because experimentation is happening so similarly we are becoming flirts in terms of trying out your products and services right so how do you deal with this kind of a flirt customer similarly another thing which i see is that well you know 
there was a time where people used to buy a product like Prinka might boast of selling a bo bo maybe a host uh, a jewelry something like jewelry right but look at from customers point of view what is it looking at is he buying a piece of jewelry or something else so this is an important fundamental question which you as an exporter or as somebody who wants to indulge in global business needs to take care of so jewelry is passe you know one is building identity because we are moving into space of what is called identity lessness right so when when you look at when you look at uh, especially b2c okay there's rise of symbolism right so uh, uh, as uh, I think somebody else alluded that to that well, you know, so so the product imagery becomes very very important. Like Mr. Day might sell uh, a kit to, uh, to 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 try out and figure out as to what kind of disease you've got, right? But mm -hmm. its play needs to be more. Similarly, for example, if Prinka is talking about that, well, I am a hosting kind of a portal, right? And you're building trust. View it from customer's point of view. Why is that you he is looking for trust? Because there is a trust deficit. You know, everybody takes the other party with a pinch of salt, right? And especially if we're coming from India, what is the job? You know? Is it that well marketers or sorry, the customers look at your product and service with a pinch of salt? Right? How do I reverse that? That becomes an important question. So what I'm saying is there is skepticism rising on the one hand. Okay, at the same time, discovery happening. There is fickle mindedness, okay, especially from B2C customer, you need to go beyond excellent product. Look into the kind of role which a product is going to pay, play in terms of forming identities of your customers, right? So these are a couple of uh, observations which I would make for the want of time. Thank you very much. I think I just wanted to quickly, uh, you know, I think there were one or two times and someone has raised this uh, challenge of, you know, small quantities having to go through the same compliance as a container load, you know. So I think that's where, again, you know, as I mentioned, so there could be other like others like Explorer as well. I'm not very sure. But then that was the whole point, right, that we could act as a consolidator so that we could represent them in those countries because uh, we could be that, you know, one point of contact so that whether it's their brand or some other brand and some other you know uh, because we are also horizontal a uh, platform there are other things which we also deal in you know that's when consolidators like us i'm sure there would be others also uh, even in the traditional world so i think that's where uh, you know uh, those consolidators could also help you identify the partners there if they also have presence and that's why physical presence and you know relationship building in that those geographies is kind of important uh, which is why you know a lot of the things that the professors were mentioning uh, luckily we were able to learn that uh, you know in the last few months of our presence and hence uh, i just wanted to say that you know finding the right type of uh, consolidators uh, because so I just wanted to give you one quick example because before I started Expora uh, I was also running a brand called Three Style and we tried to actually send our goods to Amazon US and we dealt with the same challenge right because Amazon does not help you with any of these things right you have to figure out your threat forwarder your agent uh, you know how do you reconcile so to just tell you I'm still not able to reconcile my books uh, because what happened was like I exported X amount of worth of products there and then I was able to sell X minus Y and now RBI requires you, you know, to kind of ensure that what you've written out, you need to get that money back, you know, in the next number of days. So while, of course, there are ways to close your books, it's very difficult for, you know, upcoming new brands to actually understand how this process works. Like, it's very complicated. So that's when we realized that, you know, um, having a platform which can help such, um, you know, MSMEs across the country, right, um, tackle this kind of a challenge, whether it's MOQ, whether it's compliance, etc., would be something that we'll try to address. So I'm sure there are others also. So yeah, I think that should hopefully answer the question. But yeah. Thank you, Priyanka. Um, I would now like to wrap up the discussion. We are really exceeding the time limit. Uh, it was uh, really good to have you all, uh, you know, come out for this discussion, take time out from your hectic schedules. And I'm pretty sure that the audience has a lot to take from this discussion on different market entry strategies and different things to watch out for when they're entering a new market. We will upload this uh, webinar on our website uh, also and also on our YouTube channel for those who want to watch it again. Um, so with that, I would uh, end this discussion. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhar, sir. Thank you. Rika, Devasi. Thank you, sir. Pleasure, pleasure meeting.
and uh, i think you know it has been enriching for the participants too because we addressed a lot of things yes yeah and we'll take up uh, more such It's, it was the first uh, initiative on the marketing side uh, uh, so it's a it's supposed to be a series and we'll look at several strategic aspects uh, sure sir uh yeah, thank you so much for this platform and i hope all the best if uh, i could be of any use do let us know sir we definitely collaborate and see what best certainly you are a case in fact we i thought <laughs> we should develop a teaching case on my labs uh, success during the pandemic and taking these testing kits uh, abroad and that can be uh, right and it's Absolutely. also you know as i use the word curative marketing it's also directly solving the problems and explora also provides an excellent case uh, story because a lot of uh, msmes they will not have the uh, the time energy and also the the capability to uh, go on their own so they need uh, some arrangement in the home country as well as in the host country to to help them up you know in certain uh, compliances and other requirements you know so that the risks can be eliminated and margins are there so so i think uh, it's a wonderful uh, thing and uh, I, msmes are also now excited and the you know this is the right time that we should uh, move with a fast pace sure thank you no i think we definitely try to connect offline because i'm sure there's a lot of things to learn from all of you so i think we'll try and tell the pci you know to connect all of us so we can then take it forward yes thank you so, pleasure meeting we'll we'll keep in touch yeah okay thank you all right have a good weekend everyone bye yeah yeah thank you chicken ihar haan ji sir